good morning, everybody. It's good to see you guys this morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you guys would please stand, and uh, we're going to start this morning off in worship together. to the darkness You're the only right among the wrongs You're the only hope among the chaos You are the voice that calls me on Louder than every lie I soared in every fight The truth will chase away the night your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle, mighty, it won't let us down or fail. written hope the serve I know that your word will never fail I know that in every situation you speak the power to prevail now than every lie I sword in every fight the truth will chase away your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle. Mighty, it won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power. Your name is power. speak you scatter darkness light arrives and heaven opens holy spirit let us hear it when you speak the church awakens we believe the change is coming holy spirit let us see it when you speak you scatter darkness light arrives and heaven opens Church awakens, we believe the change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. Your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle.
filled with everything. Sing praises for my King has come and is coming again. I will stand and shout it with everything. Sing praises for my King has come and is coming again. Oh, sing. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Element. My name's Aaron. I'm one of the Aarons here at Element. <laughs> it's an inside joke. Um, whether you're joining us online or in person, we are so grateful you are here, especially if you are new. If you are here with us this morning for the first time, you will find two cards behind the seats in front of you. One is for you to keep and tells you a little bit more about who we are. The other is for you to fill out so we can know you were here. You can either place those in the offering boxes by the door or come say hello to us at the Welcome Center in the back after service, and we would be happy to answer any questions you might have. If you're joining us virtually, you can see our digital connect card linked to this video or say hello in the chat area. The biggest thing to know about us is we love Jesus. Our hope is that when you think about Element, you think of a people who love Jesus and strive to connect more to, pe to people to him. We aim to glorify God by teaching and living out the scriptures, transforming community into gospel community, and planting churches. So I was asked uh, to do some announcements this morning after sharing with some of the staff about a program my son and I have been involved with together, and they thought some of you would also be interested. So the program is called Trail Life USA, whose mission is to guide generations of courageous young men to honor God lead with integrity, serve others, and experience outdoor adventure. They partner with churches across America with the goal of producing generations of godly and responsible husbands, fathers, and citizens through various outdoor adventures. So that's my son, Joel. So he's adventurous and independent, but he also hasn't been one to play in team sports. But instead, he... He thrives with mountain biking, outdoor adventuring, camping, and now trail life. Trail life has provided an opportunity for my son to join a Christ-centered organization which invests in developing boys to build life skills and enjoy adventure with other boys of the same age. Most importantly, trail life encourages fathers to walk alongside their sons during that process. So as an effort to save some time this morning, I'm just sharing the basics with you. But I will be available after service in the courtyard with details on when and where we meet, as well as invite you to an open house we have coming up in August. Along with telling you about Trail Life, I have one other item Element staff asked me to remind you of. Next Sunday at 1230, 
is our next Team Kids Roundtable. These are discussions that our eFamily Ministries hosts once a quarter in an effort to partner with you as parents on what it's like to be the spiritual leaders in your families. This quarter, we are also inviting the parents of our older students as Kevin Cobb, our high school and young adult minister, will be leading the discussion. Lunch is provided, so please let us know if you can come. If you have any questions or miss something, come talk to us at the Welcome Center in the back. After service, all sign-up links can be found in the Church Center app or at the Welcome Center as well. Now, I invite you to stand and say hello to those around you. to greet. I know it's your favorite thing on a Sunday. But do you know if, if somebody is watching the live stream like they're sick or like my wife who's working today but can watch the live stream, uh, sometimes it feels awkwardly long watching this intro video because it doesn't show the room and you guys greeting. It just shows this video and it's like, did they forget we're here? <laughs> We did not forget you're there. We know what it's like. So we're trying to find ways to make that not so long and awkward for you if you're watching. Or you can just come and hang out with us here. Fast forward. Oh, <laughs> just keep going. All right. Uh, I do have a couple announcements. We didn't want to throw uh, more stuff at the other Aaron today. So I have a couple things for you. The first one is the Classics, uh, which is our 60-plus ministry at Element, is having their one-year anniversary. And so, woo, I know. It's like... The classics and they're one year old. It's a whole thing. Um, August 3rd, Saturday, August 3rd, they're doing a barbecue for that. And if you would like to come, you can uh, sign up at the Welcome Center and they will send you directions to where that is meeting. Uh, the second thing is trivia is just like two weeks away. And if you'd like to come, sign up your team. Woo! Somebody's excited. This is good. Uh, si sign up your team. Just sign up yourself if you want to be placed upon a team. But we're trying something different for the food this year because we keep trying to bring like a food truck or something. And then people order their food and you got to wait half an hour for your food and you get a little frustrated. We get that. So there is a local butcher that we are also doing Los Alamos Days. He's part of that. And he does food on the side. And so we are going to work with him. You can pre-order all of your meals. And he will show up at 530, and he will have your meals ready to go. Wow. Yeah. So you sign up for trivia, and there's a, there's a link where you sign up of what, where you can order. Uh, he does 15 bucks tri-tip sandwiches or 20 bucks, and you get this little box, and it's got some uh, pork rice in it or something, too. So it all bacon fried rice. She's not making it, but she knows all about it. So there you go. Bacon fried rice comes with it. Uh, you can sign up. They will be ready. He will bring them, and he's good to go. So if you're going to come to Trivia, sign up for that. And again, you guys, sign up so late. I don't know why you do this. It's, it's like two days before. We'll get like a bunch of sign up. Sign up now so know who's coming. Okay. Uh, what else do I got? Oh, also, I know you're like, what? 
Right after service today, you see these cornhole things that are set up out here? What we're trying to do is facilitate a play thing between you and the kids at Element. So you can play cornhole together today. So we're going to set these things up like once a month, not cornhole, different games, but that you can actually do an all play thing between you and the kids to connect all of the community at Element together. So hang out for a little bit, throw some bean bags, if you throw your back out, go to the classics barbecue. Oh, yeah, yeah. Welcome to Element, if you're new. Uh, there are Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. If you don't own one, you can have one. If you forgot one, you can use one. Uh, there are sermon notes on the communion tables throughout the room. They look like this. And on the front side, you're going to get a short recap of what we'll talk about. On the back side, you get a couple questions. We tried to shrink them up to give you a little bit more space for notes in there. And you will get all the verses we're going to hit today. If you have a smart device, you can download an app. It is called Uversion. You click on More and then Events in Uversion. We'll come up by GPS in your smart device. Uh, my name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors at Element. But before I have you stand for the reading of God's Word, I just wanted to hit something that I didn't really talk about last week and a couple people have asked me about. And this is about the attempt assassination of, of Donald Trump. And they said, why didn't you say anything? Well, first off, I worked in my yard all day on Saturday. I didn't really watch the news. I came down here. I saw a little thing. Let me just say this. Too often when something like this happens, what we do is all we think of, oh, I hope they're not on my team. Like we just hope they're on the other side's team so that we can have a reason to say, look what those people do. All we are doing right now is splitting ourselves even further. And I've told you this before, when something like this happens, people who are, how do I say this? It's usually people who have mental issues that end up doing these things. It doesn't really matter their political views. It's people who have problems. These people need help. We need to be praying for them and for one another. We need to stop trying to divide ourselves further and further and further by saying, oh, it's not us, it's them. We need to step forward as God's people and be Christ to the world around us. Let's start there. Somebody sent me this thing th this week about how do we fix the problems, and this is the Christian, and the first thing it says is join this particular party. What we want to do is join in loving and following Christ, stepping out into this world, representing who He is. Our goal is not to put forward a party, it's to put forward Christ, and that is where we have to start. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Because <laughs> we are going to go towards this direction a bit today. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we ask that you would lead us and teach us the directions that you are calling us to step into in this world, where we would understand that we're to pray globally and locally, that we would step into the places that you have called us so we can be your ambassadors to this world, seeing you as you go forward and you do the work that you need to do, but you do that through your people. So teach us, again, to be those people. Amen. Have a seat. All right, so we are doing a shorter series for Element anyway through the New Testament book of 1 Timothy. It is going to be just 10 weeks, and I'm calling it Doctrine Matters. Uh, this is week three. I think 1 Timothy is like a big old Jersey Mike sandwich because it's doctrine on the outside, and all the meat in the middle is just doctrine after doctrine, and it all adds up to what Paul is talking about and how we begin to practically live out our lives. Doctrine, all it simply means is a body of principles, or teachings. Like when I asked my friend John Warren how to do electrical, and he says, what you do is you do not hook up a 60 amp breaker to 12 gauge wires and then pull 60 amps through them because you would start a fire. You have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm not saying I do, but you know, certain things can happen. You gotta be careful. There are certain doctrines. Well, when we talk about the doctrine that is handed down in the scriptures, it is what we get to ultimately as what is called the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ rescuing and saving us. So we look at the whole of the scriptures to see how God is leading and how he is guiding us that leads us to proper doctrine because proper doctrine actually matters. It's gonna translate into how we live our lives, how we interact with others, how we worship God. I was talking to this uh, woman in our gospel community this week, and she says, I really want the gospel to get down into my heart so everything of my past, my present, my future, how I think about things all goes through that lens. And I'm like, yes, this is what we want. 
This is what we want for everybody. So if a Bible open to 1 Timothy chapter 2, this is on page 643, if you're going to use one of the Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. And today, looking at doctrine, in our third week, we're going to see that a healthy church prays. It prays for one another, it prays for those in government, it prays for the nations, and at the end, it's going to feel like Paul takes a left turn, but he doesn't. He's not getting off the Pray for the Nations bus, but he will show us some things that detract from that. We did a whole series three years ago on prayer. It was 13 weeks, three weeks longer than our uh, sermon series is going to be in 1 Timothy. That's kind of crazy. That series centered on worship of God, and what we said is God has reached out to us in His Word, through His Spirit, and eventually this this leads to a full encounter with Him. And I spent a lot of time trying to get you to understand that prayer is not simply asking God for things. Sometimes people do this. They pray, they ask God for things, and this thing doesn't come through because God knows what we need. It's not just what we want, and He knows what we need. So sometimes He doesn't give us exactly what we're asking for. He brings something else about. And then people then say, God failed because He didn't bring about this thing I was praying for. So I told you, prayer is more about relationship growing the relationship. But today I am going to tell you, if you are going to ask for something, this is what we start to ask for. This is one of the things in the midst of it. There has always been an attempt by people in any culture everywhere to try and connect with God in some way. Anthropologists have been actually trying for years to find some culture somewhere in some isolated area without some form of religion and prayer, and they have never been able to find one. Prayer is simply a global phenomenon. It infects every culture and every life, the majority of people on this earth at some point. There is a human instinct for it, to connect to God. Karl Barth once called it our incurable God sickness, that deep inside of us, we need him more than we can ever realize. But having said all that, just because prayer is a universal phenomenon, it does not mean that all prayer is the same, and this is why doctrine matters, because it matters who we pray to and, and how we pray and why we pray. So today, Paul is going to talk about prayers for all types of people all over the earth. So here's where we're going to start. Number one, healthy churches will pray for the advancement of the gospel. Healthy churches will pray for the advancement of the gospel. Like I keep saying, the proof is in the pudding. You know, we're the pudding, how we live out our lives. Well, this is going to be part of that. Praying for the good news of what Jesus did to go forward in our lives and other people's lives. When God is evident in our lives, we will be found to be praying. Part of Element's mission statement is we want to be a church that plants other churches and to see the gospel go forward. Sometimes those, those plants go really well. Sometimes it's... They close, but they're always different than we assume. But the whole point is having the gospel go forward. Our commitment is to that. It never stops. We want the gospel to go to all of the nations. As of last year, it is still estimated there are about 7,000 people groups in the world that the gospel has not gone to yet. And this isn't just about strategy, getting a whiteboard and saying, here's how we're going to go and we're going to do this and this and this. Not that that is not important. It's totally important. But the first thing first is that we want to begin to pray for this to happen in our cities, in our world, around us. We want this to go forward. Now, I'm not trying to be controversial, but 1 Timothy chapter 2 is not typically a place that people go to, to talk about this. But again, got to keep the main thing, the main thing. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. There's kind of a flow to this. Verse 3, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And if you whittle this down, what it starts off by telling you is we pray because God desires people to be saved. We pray in alignment with God's desires. We'll be praying for these things. Prayer is more than just asking God that your 20-year-old dog gets another year so you feel better, or for your nephew or son or grandson's baseball career, or for your aunt's gallbladder surgery, or for your friend's ingrown toenails. So they stop being such a monster, right? All, all of these things. You can pray for those, but that's not the center thing. We want to pray, the focus here, 
the gospel goes forward. We look forward to see this happening. It's pleasing to God. It's in line with his desires. And you got to be clear here. This is what God wants. Now, God does not technically need us, but God has set this up in a way that we get to partner with him. There are certain things when you read through the scriptures, you will see that God in his omniscience still limits himself in certain ways. You, throughout the Old Testament, God is called the God of the covenant. This God who is free to do anything actually limited himself to this thing called the covenant. And the Jews were astounded by that because God who could do anything did that. God has obligated himself to us in the gospel. God has done this thing. And the testimony really throughout the scriptures is that when God has desire, he lifts up his people to pray. We get to participate with God because he has made it so out of his wonderful grace. One person said this, I think it was John Wesley, there is nothing God does in the world but answer prayer. Now, when you first read that, you probably have my same reaction. God can do whatever he wants. God can do whatever he wants. But what they meant was that God's going to stir up people to begin to pray about this particular thing, interceding for the world. It is not that God is powerless without your prayers or needs our prayers, but in his sovereign grace. God has deemed that we get to partner with him. And it's really amazing. You go to the book of Joshua, chapter 10, the sun stands still because Joshua asks. You go to Exodus 17, the Israelites are in this battle. And when Moses lifts his hands, they're winning. When he lowers them, they start to lose. First Kings chapter 18, fire comes from heaven because Elijah asks. In Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, it says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him in whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. This is in a section of Romans 9, 10, and 11 that God calls. God does the work. He sends us. We're part of that work. And it's like, how does this work? God sends works with his people. In Acts chapter 10, you see this guy named Cornelius and he comes to trust in Christ, he and his entire household. And it starts with Peter sitting on a roof, does not even know that Cornelius exists and God shows him a couple things. And so Peter prays, not for Cornelius, but probably for the gospel to go forward. And next thing you know, these guys show up, hey, come with us to Cornelius' house. Peter's like, well, okay, I was just praying about something like this. And he goes and he shares and Cornelius becomes saved and Peter learns something in the midst of it. God partnering with his people as we walk through these things. Uh, in Acts chapter 13, what you'll see is that Paul and Barnabas get sent out on mission in response to their prayers. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord, uh, the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Worship, fasting, prayer. Boom. Boom. Second thing this, God's desires should ultimately be part of our prayers. When we know what God's desire, we should pray those things for us, for others. Like we want to walk and be like him. Let's love Jesus. Pray for the gospel to go forward. And so we learn God's desires, not by sitting around going, God, beam them into me. I'm not saying God can't do that. Uh, it's not from eating the pizza and the crazy dreams you had last night. Not that God can't do that. He can do anything he wants. But we really learn God's desires by looking at the scriptures and reading through. That's why doctrine matters. Why we go through books of the Bible, understanding this correctly. Last year, I told you, when you read your Bible, you should read, pray about what you just read, and then read a little bit more. Paul says, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. These are prayers focused on all types of people in all types of places. Like if you're going to pray about the strongholds of Islam in the Middle East, that's a different type of prayer than when you pray about the strongholds of materialism in Western countries. If you're going to pray about the strongholds of agnosticism on college campuses, that's going to be different than if like my wife and I went to Peru a couple years ago and there's this very strong sense of animism. That's going to be a totally different type of stronghold type of prayer we're praying about. All types of prayers, all types of people. Paul is not saying you've got to figure out every name to every seven to eight billion people on the planet and pray for every single one of them. You would never get any sleep. But every Christian should be a gospel-focused believer. We're not locally focused only. We are also globally focused. And we're not globally focused only. We're also locally focused. For years, kids were told that if they really love Jesus, they're going to go into the mission field. They're going to go overseas and live in a hut and eat bugs. It's going to show that you really love God and God God really loves you. And that's great if God has that for you. 
But not everyone is called to that. And we say, you can be a missionary right where you are. But here's the problem. There's almost this backlash against that kind of thinking, where now, the last 10, 20 years, because we said, oh, no, 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 you don't have to go be a foreign missionary. Now there is this extreme lack of people going on foreign missions because we've said, you only need to be a missionary in your local area. Guys, it is both. It is both. It is local, and it is global, and there's a call, and we listen to God, and we go where he tells us to go. We do one without neglecting the other. We want evangelism in our cities, but we also need to think globally. God holds the whole world in his hands. It is why Paul says that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. That's the priority. You know, the word priority shows up in the 1400s. Uh, you know, for 500 years, this word only ever meant something that was singular, like what is first, what is the most important. That's the priority. Now, in the last 100, 150 years, you know, we destroy language. I grow up in school, and I have a really hard time today because when it's not he, her, it's they, them, it's like I don't understand the plural and the singular. Well, we did this with this word called priorities. And now we say, I have some priorities. If you went back, you know, 400 years, they had no idea what you're talking about when you say that. Here, it was like a singular thing. We have a priority, not a list of priorities. Not that you can't have priorities, but the definition of the word was what is first. And Paul says what's first is we would pray for this gospel to go forward. That should be central in what we do. So Paul talks about everyone, then especially those in power, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Now, there's a few places when you read through this, you might get off track of praying for the nations because this is still about praying for God's desires. And so far in this series, we talked about defending the gospel and then celebrating the gospel. And here it's about the gospel's advance. And so when applying these verses, it's like, so, so what do I pray for? Do I, you know, do, I, do I pray for compassion? Do I pray for their removal? Do I pray that they can stand upright during a debate or not treat the other guy like a total jerk? What, what do I pray for? We are supposed to pray that they would lead in a way that the gospel can flourish underneath them. That's what we want to begin to pray for, that there would be justice and equality, but that the laws that are passed, that the gospel is not unduly hindered. But you also know what? Here's the thing. The gospel has advanced usually when governments have enacted the most stringent laws against it when they try and pound Christianity out, because that's when people begin to truly start to live their faith. Think about this. In America, we have this right called freedom of speech. And how many people use that right to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's like, oh, I don't want you to take it away, because I may want to use it at some point. Not yet, but, but at some point. And it's so crazy, because we have certain things that allow us to be able to talk about the gospel, and we just don't do it. And so the idea of praying for people in these positions is an environment the gospel could go forward. But maybe sometimes God allows these things to happen, because the gospel will go forward better when things are actually more difficult. Many times we pray because we want our lives easier, not because we want the gospel to go forward, but we want the gospel to go forward. And so we pray for that. God, have our leaders create these environments where this can begin to happen. Now, people tend to get off track because you read this, verse 4, this is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So people then say, well, if God is sovereign, how does the desire of his not get fulfilled? Like, is this universalism? No, okay. Remember I told you about how God binds himself to the covenant, things like that. God partners with his people. He does certain things. And we're not going to understand all the pieces of that. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, it'll tell you the secret things belong to God. There are things that God does that we will never get. I, I talked to this 12-year-old uh, a few years ago about his aunt dying. His mom came and said, would you talk to my kid about this? He's asking some questions. So I said, sure. And as we talked, I, I talked about God's goodness and God's sovereignty, that God is the God of the living and not the God of the dead. And death to us seems like the worst thing, but that's not how it is to God as God transitions us. I mean, I've talked to people who have relatives that are like 100 years old. And then this relative, as 100 years old, they just, they die. And they're like, why would God take my granny or my great-grandpa away from me? And I'm thinking, they're 100 years old. I'm thinking, if I was 100 years old, I'd be mad if I was still here. I, like, my, on my certificate of death, it's going to say hamburgers and pizza. Like, that, that's why I died, right? I, too, too much of that. Well, four years later, uh, his mom is talking to a friend of mine, and she tells that all that this kid heard that I said was that God killed his aunt. 
That's all that he heard. And that's not, I never said those words. That's not what I, but it's what he heard. And if there is a gap in theological understanding between a 12-year-old and me, think about the chasm. That's between how God does things and where we are. And this is why our doctrine matters. We don't need to get lost in things we don't understand. We cannot know the mind of God. God holds the world in his hands. I can't remember my email password. Just ask the staff half the time. I'm like, what was my password? Because I can't remember what it is. So you think about this passage from the heart. God is a desire. And he's set out a way for us to be able to move the needle in some way in our prayer life. So we begin to do that. Verse 5, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. In Acts chapter 4, it reminds us there is no other name that is given under heaven by which we might be saved other than Jesus Christ. And so we have the truth and we get to proclaim this. This is last week I talked about celebrating the gospel. We celebrate this. We get to pray that God raises people up. We get to pray for the hearts of those who are sent. We get to pray for the soil of people's hearts who are going to hear this message proclaimed. Jesus came. He took what we deserved. He gives us his life. He mediates our sin before God so relationship can be restored. And when it says that Jesus is our ransom, it means that we have been released from our bondage to sin. We get to be free, free from judgment, not just from other people, but from God himself. Because he lays his righteousness upon us because of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. And we get to announce this. When I was putting this message together, we had just done a baptism celebration. A couple kids got baptized. I then received this email from our church planters who are in Thailand that, that we support. And not that this was happening where they are, but they were talking about how Thailand, there's this whole movement starting to take place. And in the northern area of Thailand, there were all these people coming to be baptized because they trusted in Christ. And I thought, this is simply incredible. We got a seven-year-old middle-class American kid and a middle-aged Thai, Thai man who have zero in common about culture or upbringing, and yet now they're family with unbreakable bonds because of what Christ has done in the gospel. What does an American kid who loves Pokemon and a Thai rubber tree farmer have in common? Redemption. When they both trust in Jesus, they get to become family. And this is why we pray that hearts would awaken here, there, and everywhere. It sounds like a Christian Dr. Zeus book or something, but here, there, and everywhere. God's desire is for people to know him. Now, Paul's going to move to this place. There are hindrances in that. So keep all that in mind. Praying for the nations, that, that's kind of what needs to be our focus. But Paul moves to a place that we are the ones who typically get in the way of that. We have things that begin to pull away. So what detracts from that mission? Well, this is where Paul goes, starting in verse 7. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, and that likewise probably points back to the pray, okay, likewise also. So that women would pray, okay? Likely also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair or gold or pearl, pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. All right, so let's talk about something that's not controversial at all. Well, compared to next week, this isn't at all, okay? But, but here we go. Paul's going to move into some things that I think are hard for us today in our modern culture. And hopefully with the work we've done today of where we are at and then the last couple weeks and through Ephesians, this kind of leads you to a place to say, I wonder what Paul is going towards today. Because you still have to see this in terms of praying for the nations. When you come to places in the Bible that seem hard, I'll tell you this, Element doesn't try to dodge those places. We read what's in the scriptures. And it's very refreshing. Because the scriptures does not change. In our world, there is fake news and Twitter and cancel culture, and you don't know which direction things are going week to week. It is refreshing to know that God word, God's word does not change. And so Paul's going to talk about some categories where men might struggle here or women might struggle here. Our culture struggles with categories of men and women. So with so much confusion, what we have to ask is, is it the Bible that's out of date? Or is it our culture that has maybe moved to a place that's out of line? And these are the questions we have to ask. If it's true, men tend to struggle in one way and women in another. It is to our detriment if we don't address it. So here we go. First off, men pray instead of argue. Pray instead of argue. That does not mean women don't struggle with arguing. I'm married. Okay, my, my, well, I usually start it, but she's better at it than I am. But, you know, we, we argue. I, we have some people on staff. They're, 
women also like to argue. I'll just throw that out there. But the connecting thread is praying for the nations. And what it is telling you is posturing over others, trying to domineer them, always talking over them, and never listening is going to steal your passion for praying for the nations. When we decide that our need to feel like we are right supersedes our need to be redemptive, then we have issues. And this is the problem with all the political discourse in our culture today. When we walk around thinking we're smarter than others, we know something more than anybody else knows, we're going to cease to pray for the gospel to go forward in ways that bring about reconciliation. When we posture up, our passion gets stolen. Now, seriously, men like to fight. Uh, I, I got a lot of friends, and, and I get this, some, some literally. Do you know that more guys like UFC and boxing than women? And that doesn't mean that some women don't like UFC and boxing. I know a few of them, okay, but it's just statistics. 60% of lawyers are still male. They want to argue. I think it's a little bit of a heart thing, but you got to ask, in our lives, are our hearts pulling us towards God or away from God? That's really the question. And when we see someone or something that rubs us the wrong way, do we want to be right or reconciled? Right or reconciled? In Ephesians, just a couple months ago, before Paul talks about marriages and kids and workplaces, he says this, Ephesians 5, 19 to 21, that we should be addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. That doesn't mean you're in a musical, you're like, hi, how are you? You don't sing it, everybody. This is a heart attitude. It's a heart attitude, giving thanks. Uh, for and for everything for, to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence to Christ. That's the type of culture we're to have, where we submit to one another in love, not trying to usurp one another. And if we're constantly competitive, constantly just wanting to win, thinking I am first, we're not going to be praying for each other or the nations. Men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Some men only lift their hands in argument. And that is a problem. We want to be lifting our hands in worship and prayer. So is our passion in being competitive or is our passion being in relationship with the living God and wanting to see his desires done in our lives? Psalm 34 verse 5 tells us that those who look to the Lord never have to hang their head in shame. This means the ideas of shame because we're saying things out of turn or doing things out of turn. Raising holy hands. Again, it's an outward expression. It's not that you're walking around like this all the time. It's an outward expression of what is going on in your heart. So, and people can see that. Like, I don't know if you ever heard that thing where, where people are like, I'm really happy. And you're like, well, tell your face because your face doesn't look happy. You know, it's, it's this outward expression, outward expression. James 1.20, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So what's going on in our hearts? And then women pray instead of being self-focused. Okay. Pray instead of being self-focused. Now, again, just, just like arguing, there are men that like to be self-focused as well. I get it, but I got to be careful getting in a lot of trouble here. Uh, but Paul starts with the word likewise, okay? Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. So the likewise, again, pointing back, what's our priority? It's prayer. Let's have our hearts focused on others rather than our, ourselves in the midst of this. And so women sometimes will dress in an immodest manner compared to guys who tend to be angry and argue with one another. Now, it's not a new idea. Paul is not getting off the pray for the nation's bus in the middle of this. And you might struggle in one way and someone might struggle in, in another way. But the heart of it here, it is our hearts. It's our hearts. There's competition there. Uh, sometimes someone will walk into a room, and my wife has mentioned this to me before, that it seems like if there's a woman that walks in a room dressed a certain way, it's like every other woman in the room goes, oh, okay, so you know, that's good. Not just a see, but, but that's kind of the thing. All of a sudden there's this, oh, what's that? Who's that? And it starts to maybe become this heart issue of what's starting to take place in the midst of that. And so sometimes there's this, I want to be first. I'm going to put myself over you. And I think what Paul is talking about in the Ephesian church, and it's hard to go apples to apples, but braided hair and pearls is not about wearing nice things out. Not like you can't wear nice things to church. It's not about that. But if you go to the back to the artwork and the statues of this period, uh, braided hair, costly attire, golden pearls is about having having three servants work on you for hours before you go out. 
going out with your friends or you know, out to dinner or even to church. It's not like going to the red carpet at the Emmys or something like that. And sometimes there are women who will cause division because they're been hung up on externals. And I'm not saying again that there aren't guys who do this too, but using our looks, our clothing, our wealth, the posture over other people who maybe don't have the same gifts as you is not wise. And so ladies, posturing over others just like the men is going to steal your passion from praying for the nations. That's what Paul is saying. And again, as I said, men do this too, but Paul is pointing out that it's something that women do struggle with. And if we gather together and we ever want to be first, we're not going to learn to serve one another in Christ. We're not going to learn what it means to submit to one another. This is not about sitting at home going, oh, I shouldn't braid my hair. I got to take off my rings or whatever. The question is not what we wear. The question is, why are we wearing it? Why are we doing what we are doing? What's the heart behind it? And so the, the theology behind this is what is first in our heart and in our lives? That's the questions. Are we mirroring Christ? Are we trying to show the world who we think they should see, which is us? Look at me, look at me. Not look at him, but look at me. And so we need godly wisdom from godly men and women for all of our kids at Element because I will tell you all our society does today is place mountains and mountains of pressure on kids to show off their bodies in ways that do not offer value or respect. And we need to be a people who show the difference of what it means to love and worship God. Again, you go back to the end. The, the point of this is praying for the nations, ours, and others. You pray for the gospel to go forward without hindrance, and we do not want to be the hindrance in any of this. Does our posturing in trying to be right or in what we wear detract from the focus of the gospel going forward? And if you struggle with dress or anger or not being able to cope when you're wrong, go back to the gospel. It is, it is Christ who has come to rescue, to draw you to himself. He does this work. He lays his righteousness upon you when you trust in him. And we get to live and walk in that righteousness. You have the approval of the God of the universe laid upon you. And you get to live in freedom of that, in peace and grace. And if you feel like you cannot be real in front of other people and you're constantly trying to hide who you really are, whether it's in arguments or looks or whatever, go back to the gospel. Worth and value come from Christ. We have the approval of the creator of the universe. We get to be sons and daughters of our Father. And so we want our hindrances begin to begin to fall away, to find our identity in Christ, because this doctrine matters. It matters. When we adorn ourselves with Christ, with a passion that comes to knowing Him, we're going to want the world to know what we know. And what do we know? Well, we know who Christ is. We know what the gospel is. And we don't want to hold it to ourselves. And we want to pray for all the nations to come to understand and live and to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the proof is in our plea. How are we beginning to live this out in our lives in practical ways? We want people to know the God who has rescued, the God who has saved us because that same God is extending himself in friendship and mercy and grace to others as well. And like I said last week, we get to celebrate that. There is great joy in what that looks like as we get to speak about it. And then we begin to pray for that. As we develop our relationship with God, that relationship develops in a way that we continue to say, God, I want this to go forward. Show me, touch them, work in their hearts, do this. God, just Teach me to keep going like this. And this is one of the reasons every week we come to this place of communion. Because communion is this reminder of God's great grace given to every single one of us. Where Christ has come to rescue and redeem us. It's why you break the cracker like Christ's body was broken for us. You dip it in the wine or the grape juice as a reminder of his blood that was shed for you and me. So that we get to come in. We get to be redeemed and restored to God's family just like Thai rubber tree farmers, just like seven-year-olds who love Pokemon, we get to come in the exact same way. We get to be part of this family, redeemed. And so we do celebrate that, and we pray that through our lives and through other people's lives that that gospel would go forward. And as we start to pray about that more and more, our focus is going to shift a little bit more and more to begin to see the world around us in ways that sees and says, oh, I could step into this or I could help somebody here. And it starts to help us to be in a gospel-centered mindset in what we do. And if you need prayer today, right across the way in the lounge, you can go during music, you can go after service, but we'd love to be able to pray for you. Maybe you're in a position that you have some perfect opportunities for the gospel to start to go forward, but maybe you don't know how to take the steps to do that. And so we'd love to be able to pray with you to help you to understand that. 
It's one of the reasons when we are in gospel communities and these are together, we want to encourage and help one another to understand how to live practically in our lives. And you know, we talk about the gospel, it's not trying to make it weird. It's, it's not like, yeah, what would you bring for lunch today? Do you know Jesus? I mean, it, it's, it, it's not like that, right? It's, it's just natural how we begin to live our lives because the thing that, that we love the most just naturally becomes something we begin to talk about. And so we naturally want to begin to talk about the good news of who Jesus is. But we want to see that happen globally and locally both coming together. So if you need prayer, we'd love to pray for you. Uh, there's offering boxes next to all the walls in the back. You can give online. Element is a church that doesn't pass an offering plate. We're a church that believes that how we give, it is part of our worship, but it needs to be done in a place that is voluntary. It's a response to what God is doing. And so we don't pass a plate. We want you to be able to give how God calls you to give. And I encourage you to grab those questions that are on the back of those sermon notes. Talk with some other people this week. Dive a little bit deeper into what this looks like and how the gospel can begin to go forward, and how you can pray for that in your own life and the lives of others around you, so that there would be this great joy as we see the gospel proclaimed. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we ask that you would move us in ways that reflect who you are and what you continue to do. We ask that the understanding of the gospel would not just be these words that we say that's all in our head, but like the, the woman in my gospel community who said, I, I want it just on my heart so that I see everything through what Christ has done and it changes really everything. That's what we want. And so I ask that as we keep walking through each piece of this series on the doctrines that really matter, that you would have us begin to live that way. That the gospel becomes more than just words. It becomes the lens through which we really see everything. Who you are, the, the grace and mercy that you extend, and though you are omniscient and omnipresent, that you are immutable, you do not change, that you are a seity, you, you stand full in yourself, and yet you have bound yourself to your people in the gospel. And that is a promise that never gets broken. And that's for us, there'd be an excitement about that, that we would understand that all of our sins were laid upon you and that your righteousness is laid upon us when we trust you and, and walk with you. And I ask that would be such a reality that we'd begin to pray for that liberating good news to go forward. And there would be this freedom that gets lived in because we understand what you have done. So have us be these people that speak about the gospel, that pray for the gospel to go forward, and to see it in ways that you lead us into, and that you would be glorified through it all, and that we would begin to live in that joy that you continue to provide. And we ask this in your son's good name. Amen. All right, so as we drop these curtains, just take a moment and ask God to reveal to you the places right now that he wants you to pray the gospel goes forward. Is it your neighborhood? Is it your family? Is it your workplace? Is it your state? Is it your country? Is it the leaders in that country? Is it certain nations around the world? Where is it? Say, God, where do you want me to be praying towards and for? And as you begin to partner with God in this, start to take some joy. Maybe write that down. And every morning when you get up, make that part of your prayers. God, I'm going to pray for this thing. And just have him begin to lay that upon you. And maybe it's not something you do right now. Maybe it feels awkward at first. But the more you do that, your relationship with God is going to develop and grow. And I think your passion for others and the nations will grow as well. God, teach me right now. Show me what you want me to be praying towards. And then write that down. And then daily begin to start praying towards that direction that the gospel would go out because that doctrine matters.
My brothers and my sisters feeling low For the orphan longing desperately for home For the broken ones who don't know where to go In Jesus' name there is hope for the mothers and the fathers on their knees For the sons and daughters trapped in slavery For the anxious heart that's fighting for some peace In Jesus' name, you are free In Jesus' name, name Amen In Jesus name Amen In Jesus name There's nothing he can do When we pray In Jesus to know they're loved through sacrifice for the words to leave the room and testify for the streets to flow with justice changing lives in Jesus name come alive in Jesus name There'd be no pain But you promised you'd go with me And you promised it you always keep But I confess how much I need you I confess that I Surely goodness and mercy 
I pray that, uh, that nothing would um, steal our passion away from um, remembering that your desire is, is the forward advancement of the gospel. I pray that nothing would stop us from praying for all people at all times, that, um, that they would walk in the freedom that we walk in, um, that, they would, uh, that they would know you, that they would um, be saved, that they would, be, um, that they would spend forever in your presence, God would just be constantly um, retuned to, uh, to praying, praying for everyone at all times. We thank you for uh, just the amazing gift that we get to uh, participate in your work, God, that you, you are all-powerful, you are in control laws, the nations, uh, you're, in, you're in control of our daily lives, and, and uh, you don't need us in any way, and yet, for some reason, you choose to let us participate, and uh, God, that is amazing, and uh, we thank you for how you've considered us, and how you've drawn us to yourself. Guys, stand with us. We're gonna sing one final song together.